Welcome to the 7 Days to Amazing podcast, where you learn how to make your life, business, and style even more amazing in the next week. Now your host, Sharon Haver of FocusOnStyle.com. Sheiksters, I'm always finding myself grooving to that music. And if you kind of like those kind of dancey, jazzy beats, you probably come from a generation where you're going to want to really listen close today. Just saying. So I am Sharon Haver, and you are about to be amazed. I have a very special guest on today's episode of Seven Days to Amazing. Just as technology constantly updates itself, so does the way we look at beauty and what is available to us. Advanced beauty solutions make it easier and more accessible than ever to maintain a fresh and natural glow. Dr. Stephen Bracci is the owner and founder of Verve Medical Cosmetics since 1999, where he focuses on, get this, non-surgical solutions to improve and maintain a youthful appearance. His studios, and they are gorgeous, are in Manhattan and Bergen County, New Jersey. Dr. Bracci can be found online at vervelaser.com. He attended the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City with residencies at New York University and Yale University. What brings Dr. Bracci to Seven Days Amazing today is that he is a creative person who has a particular interest in visual aesthetics. And in case you haven't noticed, we live in a visual world. So thank you, social media, for having our face right up there alongside celebrities and industry leaders in our field. So Dr. Bracci's particular interest lies in restoring and maintaining a youthful facial structure through the application of non-surgical injectables, cosmetic fillers, and Botox to support the skin and relax wrinkling. What he does is make people not only appear more rested and restored, but in a way that it returns their face back to its original shape. So you might want to read between the lines and no creepy look like you got caught in a wind tunnel facelift here. Basically, Dr. Bracci's method of facial aesthetics is the antithesis of the old school facelift, which focuses on stretching and pulling the skin to a different position to match the changes that occur with age. What Dr. Bracci does is to restore the lost foundation under the skin, which supports and redefines the skin and artfully restores the shape of the face. So I don't know about you, but going under the knife is not something that interests me, but having a glow sure is. So, my friends, you are about to be visually amazed. Welcome, Dr. Stephen Bracci. I am so excited to have you with us here today. Thanks, Sharon. I'm excited to be here. Great. So, Tell us a little bit on, you know, I, I know your thing is, is visual aesthetics and, and it's just keeping people looking like themselves, natural, better, but not exhausted, pulled, yanked, weird, and kind of creepy and creepy looking. So how did you start getting into this? How did, how did you come about having this interest in just sort of maintaining beauty? Well, I always had a particular interest and in, I always was very detailed oriented in terms of what I could visualize. I always picked up uh, visual clues ever since I was a little kid. I was, I'm dyslexic and I always viewed things more visually than I did, you know, um, the, the written or the spoken word. And I knew this from a very early age. And, um, and what I knew in the, in the late 90s, we knew that there was this whole concept that we could engage the idea of non-surgical approaches to making people look better. And the field has really taken off. And it's really, in many ways, changing the way we approach uh, people as they age. So, yeah, I, and I, I know one of the things about you is, you know, they say about doctors is that you have a good hand. You need I think really when people go into anything like this, you really need to be with someone who has a good hand and a good eye. Because, you know, we've all seen the results of things that kind of, scare the living daylights out of us. And and I know a lot of people are afraid to sort of look at advanced beauty, but it's with us. It's like what I, I said in the intro. It's just like, you know, technology updates itself. So does the way we take care of ourselves. And 
And when we're, especially if you're a business owner or you're on social media or, you know, it's your job, you're in the same light as a celebrity, as in an industry leader, as in a thought leader. So you can't have yourself looking burnt up and chewed up and sort of woe begotten when, when there's options that you can just look fresh and there's nothing wrong with looking fresh. You know, it's just looking creepy and tight and done is one thing. And if, if you want to do nothing to your skin, I mean, that's totally fine. But I've been using anti-wrinkle cream since I'm 16 years old. I kind of was a kid growing up and I, you know, I said I wanted to look hot at 40. So how did I, how would I look hot at 40? I could either like, you know, play my luck and, and craps and figure out, okay, maybe I will. I come from good genes. Or I could put on a little moisturizer every day and some stuff under my eyes. I mean, so I, it's, this is all very natural to me. It's just taking care of yourself, skincare, having a regimen every day that you follow is, is normal to me. And then taking advantage of things that take it a little bit further is icing on the cake. You know, it, it's what's happening in a modern world. So that's, that's kind of a long one for me, but you know, like on your end, like what was your defining moment, your first big sort of career hallmark to decide that this is something that you wanted to do and that you can help people kind of take, the tried and true to the next level and, and still look real and gorgeous and beautiful and not creepy. So the two biggest career hallmarks were in the late 90s, we started coming to the idea that we could do things with the skin with lasers to improve the texture of the skin and the color of the skin and reverse some of the ages signs of aging, namely uh, skin damage from sun exposure. But the biggest thing that really changed my career was the was the the, the advent of my procedure that I, that I developed um, in the mid 2000s and that is the iRise procedure basically up until up until the mid 2000s there was really nothing on the market to address under eye bags and the biggest complaint that people had was they looked tired and people accused them of not getting enough sleep when in many times people had full night sleep and they still look tired. A lot of it is a genetic thing that happens to people over time. And so I started thinking about the eye, eye area and saying, well, basically what's going on is, is it's really not, people are not gaining skin, they're not gaining fat, but what they're doing, what's happening with time and age is they're losing foundation underneath their skin. And obviously everybody has a different um, structure to their face. Some people uh, are particularly skinnier I call it skinnier because they don't have the foundation under their eyes. And so when they age, it becomes even more pronounced at an earlier age that they get bags under their eyes. But what these bags truly are is that they are a loss of foundation. There's a loss of, of structure that's supporting the skin, and they get an indented um, appearance, which looks makes them look tired. So I developed the iRise procedure, which is basically supporting underneath the skin with various fillers to restore the shape of the eyes. And what that does is it gets them back to where they were previously. It's the, it, like you said, it's the antithesis of, of surgery because we're not cutting and pulling the skin. We're supporting and lifting underneath the skin and giving it back to its original position rather than changing the position of the skin. So that was something that took off in the mid-2000s, and we've done many more things since then. So how... You know, tell tell me how you, if someone was coming into you and they were just a little concerned that they were looking a little tired, what would you, what, how would you look at them? And, and if someone really was sort of gun shy at doing anything, I, I think so many people are just, they're just afraid to take the chance that this is going to be something permanent. None of this stuff is permanent. So how would you sort of deal with someone and tell them and what, what, who do you think is the right candidate to sort of take care of themselves this way? Well, the, the biggest thing that is people's fear is that they're somehow going to look different than than they originally looked. They're going to alter their appearance, and they're going to do so permanently. The first thing is is that any procedure that I do is not permanent, number one. Number two, these procedures are done in front of a mirror when you're wide awake. So basically, I usually do take little baby steps and show them the improvements and get their um, get their approval to go on to the next step. So it isn't something like 
you, you take it or leave it and you, and you get done with the procedure and you walk out and you, you get what you, you get and you don't get upset. It's not like that at yeah. all. It's just the opposite. You basically have the ability to, it's like, it's like basically adjusting it, your hair length. You can, you can go along and decide how, how it is during the, during getting your hair cut. It's no different than that. Um, so, and the, and the third thing is, is that the procedure allows me the, the ability to reverse the product. The, the main product that I'm using under the eyes, for example, is a gel, and that, that gel can be, um, can be dissolved and turned into water. So if people really didn't like it, they could take it out. I, I, I don't think I've ever done that because people, um, you know, they like the procedure and they, they like it. I mean, in, if you give somebody too much, you can adjust it down. So you have a lot of control on the actual results of, on these procedures. So another thing is I know we've spoken about this in the past, which is one of my pet peeves. Like you see someone and they obviously have had a lot of Botox in their forehead. So their forehead is like shiny and tight and, you know, you can you can flip a quarter on it. And then they have a horrible, crepey neck and they have really big frown lines. And, and it just the contrast of where they're so wrinkled, which probably just looks okay before now is heightened against something like a really tight forehead so i know you talk a lot about symmetry and balance and just keeping your whole face in sync because obviously we don't wrinkle in one area and not the other i mean i kind of think of this as like you know you're painting your house you see this little piece of dirt on the wall and you go get the white paint you, you paint the dirt and you cover it and then you're like all of a sudden something else looks wrong and something else looks wrong and something else looks wrong so in one hand you know you, you want to know when to stop but in the other hand you want to make sure that everything looks balanced and not one thing is like too done or softer and by contrast, everything else is more wrinkly. So how how do you deal with that to create some symmetry and balance and, and a natural I, I I agree with that. Um, the biggest challenge with my industry is people going in and telling their physician or their provider what they want rather than getting an expert opinion mm -hmm. on what is going to make them look best overall. And it obviously depends on their budget and what they want to accomplish. But somebody who's ter very wrinkled and has deep folds between, you know, the nasal labial folds, which is the folds between their nose and their mouth, if they're deep, it would, it doesn't make any sense to big, get big plump lips because it just, it's going to yeah. stand out. And I always educate people when they come in for their lips, you have to treat the area around the mouth first before you can treat the lips. It, it doesn't match and it, it's going to stand out and everybody's going to know you had something done. It has to match the area adjacent to it. Otherwise, you look, you know, you just, you look like you're trying too hard, and it's not a good look. No, it's not. And the other thing is, too, I know a lot of women get, I forget what you call it, those little furrows between your eyebrows, and then you see them doing, a, like, a, a Facebook Live video, and it's really close on your face, and they have these two deep furrows. And it makes them look angry. You know, they always look mean and angry. And maybe in real life, it's fine. But when you're, you know, on camera, I know, you know, I, when I was a stylist, I did tons of, of magazine covers. And, and now social media has made it that every magazine cover is every social media photo, I should say, is our magazine cover. So it's our close up. Like we are living in a this is your close up world. So something like that would sends a subconscious signal to someone that, you know, she's mean, she's angry, and it's just really right. it's just a wrinkle. So how do you sort of deal with someone who is mostly an entrepreneur or someone whose business is teaching them on social media where they need to, you know, not look done up and kooky, but they need to look authoritative and relaxed and, you know, not... Well, well that area between the, the, between the brows is very treatable um, non-surgically. Uh, the first and foremost thing is we use Botox to block the muscular pull that r actually wrinkles the skin. Basically, what's going on in that area is you have muscles and they keep, like an accordion, they keep wrinkling the skin over and over again. In turn, that wrinkling the, of the skin causes damage to the skin and it causes collagen breakdown where you get resting lines. So the first thing that we do to treat that area is we add Botox and that Botox will block the muscular pull, so that will give a big improvement. For people who have deep furrows that, that continue even at rest, 
we can actually fill underneath and restore that foundation so we can block that, you know, those curvatures, that those 11 lines, we call them, that go between the brows. So we can re restore a completely normal appearance that is really unidentifiable on any uh, photograph or, or, or video camera, or and especially as you mentioned in high definition TV, we can make it look so natural and restore the shape back to its original position. So it's not identifiable even to me who I obviously am an expert at this and I study people's faces. And I, the, the key to my work is to have when the client returns to, to not know and by looking at them to not know what was done. Mm -hmm. I have to I have to look in the chart. That's the way I I, I, val I I judge my own work is to say, okay, when this person returns, when I look at them, would I know that they had anything done had I not known they were here before? That's yeah. that's my litmus test to see that this person looks like they're still from this planet. That's that's <laughs> the goal to make to make them look like, you know, they're real. Yeah, I know. It's it's like, I don't know. It's like one of my little obsessions. It's like I love, especially now, I you know, I've been doing a lot of traveling and speaking and I go to small towns and, and places where you see these people who are, are trying to, you know, they're trying to keep up and they're not they're not keeping up in, I don't know, a more national, global, updated way. And you see them, you're like, oh, my God, that is some facelift or oh, my God, that is some, you know, Botox, they can't even move. You know, when I was growing up as a kid, they used to call it the Dr. Diamond nose job. You would get those girls and they would take these big beaks and get these tiny noses that were adorable, but they didn't match their face. And it was like, and as you see them getting older with these tiny little noses and these big faces, and I, I always felt so sorry for those people. It's because, you know, they, they didn't go in come, thinking they would come out looking weird and done. So what, what would... If you had to, you know, look at it, I always ask people, like, what does amazing mean to you? So if somebody wants to look amazing and they're a little gun shy, what does it mean to you? What do you think they should do? What, when do you start? How do you start? Do you start with creams? Do you start with procedures? Does this stuff hurt? Like, give us a little bit, you know, of where someone who knows nothing about any of this and doesn't want to come out looking like one of those weird Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde characters. Well, the, 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 first thing, the first thing is, is, Around the around the eyes and the forehead and the corners of the eyes, the first thing is to address the wrinkling of the skin. And I always say to younger people, if they can do Botox a couple of times a year, it will look natural. But the key to that is that not only will they get improvements in the way they appear, but they'll also uh, give a prevention effect. Because the more you, like I said before, the more you move your skin, the more it damages the skin and the more it damages you have collagen breakdown and then you develop mm. resting lines. So for the upper the half of the face, the, 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 real, the real thing that we've come up with in the last 15 years is that people who can do Botox and they don't have to do it all the, all the time, but they can do it a couple of times a year and they can get tremendous benefits because they can get look better not only when the Botox is still taking effect, it, you know, both, Botox will last at best two, three or four months when you get a treatment. So if you do Botox a couple of times a year, you can, you can give yourself a rest, a skin rest. And that skin rest allows your collagen in your skin to repair itself because it's not, it's not moving and you can prevent wrinkles. And for the lower two thirds of the face, the biggest thing that happens, Sharon, is that we lose support, we lose foundation underneath our skin. So all the creams in the world and all the good hydration and carrying a water bottle is not going to address the loss of, uh, of foundation or structure underneath your skin. And these structures under our skin naturally deplete with time and age. They, they include things like muscle and bone and fat. Fat's a big loss. I mean, people are always wanting to lose fat, but obviously... You, your fat in your youth is is a contributing factor to how young you look. And if you deplete all the fat in your face, what's going to happen is your skin's going to have a loss of support and it's going to fold and wrinkle differently. It's just a fact of life. So the surgical approach that we had of yesteryear was, well, okay, we lost foundation and now we have more skin than foundation. Let's go in and cut and let's stretch everything back. And you and I know that fixes the wrinkles, but it doesn't necessarily make you look better. It just makes you look different because yeah. now you look, you know, you look wind tunnel, you look stretched. Look, and now you look like an alien. 
Alien, exactly. So the lower half of the face, if you can re-support the skin and give yourself some foundation back by filling it back in, and that requires an artistic uh, hand and an artistic eye to, to restore the shape of the face, you, you're you well on your way of uh, of looking way better than your peers with each passing decade. That's a given fact. You can look much better. You can look rested. You And the key is you can look real and most importantly, you can look more like yourself instead of somebody different. Does this stuff hurt if someone's afraid of pain? Because a lot of people see needles and they're like, ah, you know, I know my husband's a doctor and he has, has to give someone an injection sometimes and they pass out. You know, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, a pain is always a relative thing. Um, I know because I do these injections on myself, it's far less painful than when I go to the dentist. I, I know. Um, <laughs> basically... Basically, I'm not, you know, the way I do procedures, I don't use needles. I use what's called a cannula, and a cannula is like a little tube, and it's once it's underneath the skin, I can insert the products in different locations, and you don't feel it because cannulas are not sharp. They're dull, and they allow you to put products underneath the skin and support the architecture with really very minimal discomfort, very, very minimal. I don't give any pain medicines because people don't require it. It's obviously, it's more um, of an odd feeling when you get these treatments than it is painful. That's a good way. Uh, yeah. So I have um, I have a, a group, a Facebook group. It's a private insiders group for people on my list. And, if, and I've had some of my insiders, I asked them a couple of questions to ask you, and I have them. For people listening in, if you would like to be able to be in my my Facebook Insiders Club. It's really easy. You can go to www.focusonstyle.com forward slash insiders and get all the information you need to sign up. But in the meantime, I have a couple of questions. And if you don't mind, I'd like to sort of like help them out. And since they were just asking me and, and ask you and see if you can give us some advice. Um, Valerie asks, how do you stop aging in its tracks? What's the best thing you can do in midlife to slow the process down? What's more important, diet or exercise? Do vitamins and supplements help? Um, I think diet by far is the most important thing um, uh, as it relates to the whole, you know, the whole makeup of the body um, in terms of getting the adequate calories and proper nu nutrients and not getting too many calories, obviously. Uh, but second to that, um, the whole idea of aging really in medicine is is not addressed the right way. Uh, I think basically it should be measured in terms of your functional capacity, and that's your ability to have strength, your ability to have endurance, and carry on the normal activities of life. And you cannot you cannot maintain that at a high level for a long time unless you exercise. It's 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 impossible. So you can't really say one versus the other, but both, definitely both those combinations. If you look at longevity studies, um, basically, you know, the, all the places in the world where people live the longest, they all have a, a habit of doing daily exercise. They, they, you know, they're they're in in Oakinawa. There's the people that live the longest. They tend to a garden every day. They tend huh. to walk, and uh, obviously, they live basically on a more of a plant-based diet with most, mostly fruits and vegetables. So you, th those two things in combination can't, be, can't escape to avoid, to, to avoid the aging process or minimize. Uh, really, you're not going to avoid it, but you want to minimize it. And the goal really should be to, to be as functional as possible and high, highly functional as long as possible. So I think that, that's a more realistic goal than, than avoiding the aging process. Mm, yeah, functional and vital. Okay, PJ asks, how much sleep for optimum skin health? Best products to use that are proven, none of that fancy crap. Okay, so sleep, we know we know that people need, most people need somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep. And the only way you're going to know is whether, you know, a good test, if you go to a movie theater in the middle of the day and you're watching the theater and if you're going to fall off and doze off, you're probably not getting enough sleep. So uh, the only way people know is if they get enough sleep is whether they, you know, whether they can nap in the daytime. If you can nap in the daytime, chances are you're not getting enough sleep. And, you know, obviously if you're relying on alarms to get you up, most, most of the time that alarm is going to be set off before your actual nat natural wake cycle is and you're probably not getting enough sleep. Most Americans don't get enough sleep and I think yeah. it contributes to their 
to their bad bad appearance, um, and, it, and it contributes to their ill health and and diminishes their longevity. Yeah, and productivity. Okay, yeah, Gen- exactly. Gen C asks, why is aging bad? Why aren't women nowadays able to just embrace it? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't really know what, why people have to have this concept that they have to be functionally impaired. It's, it's, it's a normal thing to look, look and, and appear functionally in disrepair. I don't understand that. I, because we know, we know that if you take care of yourself and you do the right things, you can appear very, um, very youthful for a long time. So I don't really know what the sin is. It's like saying, okay, well, why do you, you know, it, why is it a curse to take care of yourself? I guess it's like when you're in school, you know, when you're younger, people say, well, you, you, you shouldn't tell anybody you study hard or work hard at school. Like, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with if you want to take care of yourself and look good? I yeah, mean, I, I, I don't know what the, what's I the alternative know. looks you know? The alternative is to be dead, and you know, there you go. If you're gonna be, if I say, if I'm gonna be alive, I want to be good at. Plus, you want to feel confident, exactly. and I think most people feel more confident when they look good. I mean, I know when I talk exactly. about their style, their business, you get that extra bounce in your step when you know you've got it going on. When you feel good, you feel much more confident. That confidence translates into what you do as a business person. It it just makes you more viable, more it, more more better it just makes you it makes you you present better you present better you present better better. and and with that you end up doing more things get more riches with those riches you're better for your to your family you're better to your friends you're better to your business it all you know it's it's a a very positive dom it's like the I, i don't know what's the positive way of a domino effect one you know each thing begets the other thing and i know we were talking before it's like why why is aging bad? It's like, why is personal hygiene good? I mean, do you not brush your teeth every day? Do you know not to fart in public? You know, do you use deodorant? <laughs> you know? It's like you do that. It's, so why can't you take care of your skin and, and yourself? You know, I said earlier, I've been using um, cream on my face since I'm 16 years old. You know, that's a choice. I have cousins who are close to my age who, like, were total – that white, brand, well, I could say ivory soap girls, and they are really wrinkled. They are really wrinkled, and we have similar genes. We're related. I know that um, I'm lucky. My parents both weren't very, you know, they, they aged well. When my father passed away, suddenly we needed to get a rabbi, and we realized we didn't have one. And I found some guy, and I went through this whole thing with a rabbi, and then, then he showed up at the um, at the funeral home. And he looked at my father and he's like, oh, my God. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, my father just passed away. suddenly. like, what is it, Rabbi? And he's like, you didn't tell me that was Marty. You told me that was Martin. I'm like, what? He says, I, because he knew him by his nickname. He goes, I had no idea he was 71 years old. I'm like, well, I guess, you know, good genes run in my family. Uh, there's there's a time for a compliment, right, when you're dead. But so, I mean, I, I know you look, yeah, good. you look good dead. But, you know, I, I, you know, but with that, I, you still use sunscreen is so important. You still, so I don't really understand this argument because for me, Take care of yourself. You put conditioner in your hair. Don't you look better when your hair looks groomed than when you're ungroomed? So I just think I like to call it advanced beauty. And just like everything else in life, it's a choice. You know, you can choose to take care of yourself or you can not. So it's a choice. And it shouldn't be a sin if you choose to take no, care of yourself. No, I, I don't. It's just I don't understand it. You know, and I understand like there's a lot of times you hear someone who's like 30 and they're like, I will never do that. Well, that's great. You know, check in when you're 40, 50, or 60. Do you still feel the same way? You know, our our values change. Things change. Yeah. Things change. I mean, you know, I remember when I was little in the 70s, it was like a big deal for women to color their hair. It was like a big deal. It's like, oh, my God, is that real? Is that a wig? Because people didn't color their hair. And now, you know, many people color their hair. It's not, it's, it's become normal. Nobody even, nobody even questions it. And, and quite frankly, you can go up to a woman and say, oh, I like your hair color. It really looks nice. So and be, it's and like it's, be, it's out in the open. Nobody yeah, says anything. They're flattered. not in denial. Like, you know, do you know how much I pay for that hair color? <laughs> yeah, anyway, exactly. So now I have another question from Elizabeth. She says, 
how to make an aging body keep up with the young one in your mind, wink, wink, and yet honoring the age you are now. Well, I don't think you, I don't think one contradicts the other. You can honor the age you are, but like I said, if you take care of yourself and you exercise, you're going to present as a much more youthful person because you're going to be much more functional. Mm-hmm. I see people all the time, and one of the things that I see is that people that don't exercise when they're older, if you see when they turn their head, a lot of times they turn their whole body. It, it's, it's as if their neck joint becomes so stiff that they don't even use their neck anymore. They turn their whole body to turn because they're stiff. They're they're not they're not using that part. It's no different than the stiffness you get in your knee and your elbow. If you don't use yourself and you don't have good muscular tone, then you're going to start changing the way you function and the way you function makes you appear older. And I don't care if you have the most useful looking face in the world. If you are if you have that kind of that kind of body image, you're you're always going to appear much older than you are. Mm-hmm. I agree totally. Okay, and one last question from Donna. Is there anything I can do to beef up my sparse eyebrows? Um, you know, there's a medicine on the market called Latisse, and it mm-hmm. got approval for lashes. Uh, interesting enough, it works on the brows too. So Latisse is a medicine that stimulates. They actually found, the way they found Latisse to work, it was used as a glaucoma medicine, and they found out serendipitously that people that were putting this on their eyes were getting longer lashes. So they started doing it. They did a study and sure enough, people's lashes grow a lot longer when they're taking Latisse, which is basically a once a day little liquid drop that you put on your lashes. But if you put it on your eyebrows, it will thicken them um, Mm -hmm. tremendously. Um, One of the things that I always tell young females is to not pluck their eyebrows or to do very little of that because what happens is Naturally, you lose your eyebrows with time and age as you as you grow older. And when you're younger, if you're basically plucking your eyebrows, what you're doing is you're damaging the roots. And then those damaged roots are going to obviously be subject to changes as you age, and you're going to lose your brows. And that's why you see a lot of middle-aged to older women, they basically have to start penciling in the yep. brows when they were younger. They overplucked. So that's I always, nice. I, like I, I tell my daughter, and I tell people there's like these little there's these little on amazon you can get these little um, brushes that are like little razors and you can trim the brow without damaging the roots so you don't have to sacrifice the shape of your brows when you get older and you don't have to but but what if you do if you do have thin eyebrows i'm convinced that and i know i've seen people it definitely works to put the latisse on the brow Mm -hmm. itself it's not an approved use of it but it works I'll try that. And if you want, Donna, if you need a good brow pencil, I like Anastasia Beverly Hills, Mac, and Talika do have ones that um, they look real when you put them on. So I have a question. So it's kind of a hard one because they wouldn't be coming to you to begin with. But I, it's, I have two questions I usually like to ask people. It's like, what do you, when someone is resistant to doing this, what do you say to them? I mean, obviously, if they came to you, they're considering it. When they're a little gun shy, if somebody is resistant, what would you say to, you know, not do this? And what is the resistance you usually see in your practice, if any? I would assume that once they, they make the call to, to, to you, to Verb Laser, that they've already, they're thinking about it. Um, the biggest fear that people have, obviously, is that they're going to look fake. Nobody mm-hmm. wants to look fake. They're all, I mean, I get, obviously some people look fake, but very few people want to look fake. And most people want something done, but they don't want it to be noticeable to others. And, mm-hmm. you know, I try to, I, I, I show them with photographs and I convince, I, I allow them to, see the process as it goes along so they so they have control. A lot of it is a control issue and if they feel like they're secure that they can they can opt out at any given time during the procedure, that gives people a lot more confidence um, to do the yeah. procedures that I offer. That control is very interesting. I I notice that myself too when I have people talking to me for VIP days and all sorts of stuff. There's definitely the resistance I get is the control. It's like it's sometimes it's so easy to 
kind of, especially in business, sign up for all these business advancement things and do all these things that you could sort of push papers around. But when it really comes to looking in the mirror, they kind of freak out because it's a control issue. It, it brings up all sorts of wounds. And they realize sometimes that they really don't want to succeed, that they really are purposely holding themselves back. So it can become very emotional as well, you know, because it's just suddenly you're, you're, you're dealing with things that you've been trying to bury. So, well, well, it, 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 more to your point is people have been told for years that, that somehow they're a sinner and they're, they're not authentic if they don't let their, they don't let things go the way time and age had them planned. And, you know, that's, people are changing their opinion about that. It's not such a sin to, to want to look good and, it, and nor should it be, you know, something that they have to apologize for. Yeah. I, and it's, you know, it goes back to like, technology. I mean, who would have thought 10 years ago that I could take this audio, it could be recorded, and I could have somebody, you know, send it to, to, to Michael to edit, put it up online, have it go out in two seconds, and no one ever left the desk. I still find the internet amazing. I still find Google amazing. I find my iPhone incredible. So 10 years ago, would that, 15 years ago, would you have thought that that would be happening in your everyday life? Exactly. That, that would be normal? And so to me, it's, it's still the same thing. So what does amazing look like to you, Dr. Brashi, in your life? What What is amazing to you? Well, the thing that is the most amazing is when I can take somebody that feels like they're tired, that doesn't look like themselves, and they just don't present the same way, and I can treat them, and I can restore the shape of their face to the point where they're not only much more rested looking, they're more, um, they look more like themselves. And quite frankly, they look much more attractive. It's a very rewarding feeling. And, uh, and, I, and, the, and the happiness that people uh, express when they can look in the mirror and see their face restored to an earlier position, it makes them very happy. And that's a very rewarding feeling. And that's, yeah. that's my amazing. That's my amazing. <laughs> because, because people don't have to sacrifice and look fake. They don't have to look different. They don't have to go through crazy surgical interventions. They can do something that's done in the office, and they can get instant results, and they can basically do something that has minimal to no downtime. And, and, and the key to this, the biggest key to this, is that it can be maintained. And what I mean by maintenance is that when you do these procedures, by coming back on a yearly basis, the structure and the shape of the face can be maintained indefinitely. And that's the biggest thing that we couldn't do in the past. We couldn't maintain the shape of the face. And we tried all these harsh remedies like cutting with surgery and all these different, and, and fancy makeups, which are basically camouflaging the underlying problem. We can actually restore the shape of the face and maintain it. And that's something we couldn't do in the past. Yeah, because a lot of the creams, I mean, they're just band-aids for, you know, not solving the problem. So... If someone wanted to have three or four things, I'd love to give people takeaway tips. What three or four things can you or two or three or whatever you want, can you recommend for someone to just be more amazing in the next seven days? Um, I guess the key, we've touched on these things, is the key is to take care of yourself. Um, and one is the first thing is just get enough sleep. And, mm -hmm. you know, just pay attention to your body. And if your body says seven and a half, then get seven and a half. And if your body says nine, get nine. But you, you really have to, you have to be, you have to be honest with yourself because if you're sleepy in the daytime and you can fall asleep watching it, you know, at 12 o'clock noon, you can fall asleep watching TV, you're not getting enough sleep. And if you're struggling to wake up in the morning and you have all these alarms and snooze buttons, you're not getting enough sleep. And, and it's the simplest thing to do, and the studies show over and over again that one of the most disruptive things you could do to your body is, is, is have sleep deprivation, especially people who work shifts and night, nighttime workers. They suffer a lot of health consequences, and they have a lower life expectancy, not to mention that they're more likely to be obese, more likely to have depression. It goes on and on. So this is really rough stuff. Second thing is, is find an exercise program that you can do. In, that you're going to maintain. Some people, it's, you know, I can handle walking 45 minutes a day, or some people, it's like, I like swimming, or I like bicycling. But it has to have something in your day that keeps you highly functional. Um, and it's something you can do every day, something that you enjoy. Um, and, you know, just, uh, you know, 
and I, I guess the other things are just to to pay attention to the things that make you happy. And it's a cliche, but you have to you have to set set times out for yourself in terms of your happiness with family and and friends and just enjoying yourself. And um, and just know that you know in terms of the facial architecture, there's a lot more we can do now. We can we can keep you looking rested and real and keeping the shape of the face the same with injections, and you don't have to have surgery. Oh, sounds pretty good to me. So, how, what are the best way for uh, listeners to connect with you? How can people find you? Uh, you can go to my website, which is vervelaser dot com, uh, or you can find me on Facebook. Um, um, and uh, and you can, I guess, mo- most importantly, come to my office and meet with me personally, and I can give you my expert opinion. Do you want to give a phone number or something so they can find you? Uh, sure. Our, our main number is 212-888-3003. That's 888-3003. And if you're not in New York, vervelaser.com. And um, yes. Dr. Brasci will talk to you and, and tell you how you can feel amazing. Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> so thank you for coming here today. Thank you for being here. I, I learned something. I love talking to you about this because I find it so interesting. And I and I know we've spoken in the past. You know how I hate that crazy wind tunnel look. And um, I just think really, you know, advanced beauty is about maintaining confidence, I think. You know, some people say they look better now than they did 20 years ago. And it's maybe because now they're actually – taking care of themselves. It's like, you know, now the buzzword is self-care, but hey, there's nothing wrong with self-care. You know, you are, you got to love yourself too. So thank you for being here. And um, everyone, you know, reach out to Dr. Bracci if you have any questions. So talk to you soon, everyone. And thank you for another great episode of Seven Days to Amazing. That's a wrap. Well, not so fast. Don't forget to hop over to FocusOnStyle.com for exclusive content to help you live your most amazing life with style and success. For even more great stuff that Sharon only shares by email, subscribe to her in the know list at www.FocusOnStyle.com insiders. See you next time. 